everything. The cake was blowing in the wind like this. She looked like a flag tornado and turned it upside down. He made the little end on top and then we get on the bottom. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mike Fanning, and welcome to another edition of Special Effects. In this edition, we'll be taking a look at the behind-the-scenes specialist who pieces together the movie, the editor. It's the editor's responsibility to fashion the intricate pieces of movie magic into a coherent cinematic whole. We're fortunate to have with us the respected editor, John Victor Smith. Mr. Smith's contributions to the art of editing have included work on such films as Cuba, The Harder They Come, Equus, and in collaboration with noted director Richard Lester, Help, The Three Musketeers and The Four Musketeers, Superman 2, and currently showing this summer, Superman 3. Hello, John. Hi. John, I'm sure that on a film like this, the editor has to be involved long before anything is even put on film. Can you tell us about your role in Superman 3 from the start of the project and how you work with the special effects team? In terms of, um, should we take the Superman films, they uh, have a very extended period of pre-planning and um, all of the major participants which means the production designer and in very the cameraman and uh, the, the various people the these the people who are going to build the sets and um, all of the other major technicians invariably start at least six months before um, shooting commences and um, we well, what we do, if we have a large action sequence, invariably we have an illustrator come in and he simply reads the script as it is set with the action sequence and then he illustrates it set up by set up. And this is done in collaboration with the director and with the cameraman and with myself. And um, as the scene is illustrated, it is invariably pinned up on a large board on the wall and we will have meetings and the director will look at it and he will run through and decide whether or not he likes um, the illustrator's interpretation of how the scene is going to look and uh, all the other major participants will obviously make their suggestions or well, whatever and uh, um, each given sequence may um, go through um, several stages of development I mean there may be something which the director feels will not work the way it has been drawn and therefore he will ask to have it redrawn and therefore the illustrator will redraw it um, to the director's specification and later the other people will come back again and we will look at it and eventually through this process of development eventually we should end up with an entire action sequence drawn out shot by shot and then each um, of the major participants will be given a copy of um, these drawings which we call a storyboard and um, because on films of this scale one often has three or four different units shooting at once um, there obviously has to take place uh, at, at a later stage once the entire sequence has been storyboarded the, it will then be decided who which unit is going to shoot each of the of the various setups which have to be done I mean some are very self-evident I mean some by the very necessity, it may be done in miniature because, for instance, I mean, if it were to be a large chemical factory on fire and we felt that we couldn't burn down a large chemical factory, we may build a miniature and, and, ha and have a, a fire and smoke going and therefore the miniature unit would had take on that responsibility. And therefore, as one went through the various setups, one would then decide which of the setups the miniature unit would do. And then one would decide which of the setups the main artists would appear in, which would obviously be, they would be shot by the main unit director. And, on, and then on top of that, if there are some particular special effect shots, which had to be, say, for instance, which was so dangerous that the, the artist, shall we say, could not be s that close to f smoke and flames, one may have to do it by another method, yeah. by um, 
shooting the smoke and flames on one piece of film, and then the artist has shot another piece of film, and then the optical department will marry those two together at a later stage. And so obviously all these things have to be planned, so each unit knows what his responsibilities is going to be on each sequence throughout the picture. And this process takes from six, seven months prior to the commencement of shooting. And, and obviously, um, as the shooting goes on, it is one of the editor's responsibilities to see that all, this, all these units meld together and all the material that is shot will all eventually all be integrated to make the sequence as it has been visualized. But I'm sure in a film like Superman 3, there were plenty of complications. Can you tell us about some of the unexpected problems that developed? One of the biggest difficulties is that because so many different units shoot them, and some of the shots are concocted in the optical department, so you only get pieces at a time, and therefore it, it does become very difficult to get them shaped because one's always missing a segment. I mean, and one particular thing which was, was very difficult was um, putting the oil back in the tanker, because in the film, Superman, for reasons which people who have seen the film will know, he has to go to an oil tanker which has been holed and all the oil is lying out in a big oil spillage on the surface of the sea and he has to blow it with super breath back into the tanker and that did of course present major problems to the special effects and certainly to me as the editor of the picture in fact I think almost every department we had very very big trouble because after all it's not an easy thing to do as I'm sure anyone would agree and it did take a great deal of time and ingenuity um, and even ingenuity in the editing to, to finally decide how we could do it. I mean, it was a question of one had it illustrated on storyboards, which of course is very easy because you have Superman with his cheeks all puffed out and the oil's disappearing, but to actually do that is very difficult. Uh, and it is true to say that we did try um, several different processes, actually, of, of getting it to look realistic and it really was quite a, a big headache for all concerned actually but I think that eventually we did it and I think that um, it is in fact successful and we do see Superman blow the oil back into the tanker. John you mentioned you have to match footage from all different sources well let's say you have to match a full-scale set of a ship with footage of a miniature of a ship what kind of problems do you have there? The main problems are really given to the, shall we say, to, to the people who are actually photographing um, the, the miniaturized things. If, of course, water is very, very difficult to get the um, water droplets small enough and to be moving at the correct pace for the scale in which one is working. I think that most um, model makers have little tables stuck away somewhere, and, and so if they're working shall we say, to one-tenth scale, they know that very roughly they may have to shoot at, um, uh, uh, at 72 frames or 96 frames because then, working at that scale, the water droplets will look correct. And in fact, in the Superman 3, we did have um, some miniaturized scenes on water. In fact, we had some, some of the oil tanker shots in the picture were done with miniatures, and we did have quite some serious problems with water, actually. Another very difficult problem with water is, of course, is lighting it correctly. Um, in this particular film, um, a lot, most of the water shots were done out of doors, which, of course, makes things much easier because you have natural sunlight and the sky is normally reflected in the water, so obviously it looks right. But once you go indoors and you have water, it does become very, very difficult, actually, to, to light it properly so that um, it looks as if it is what it's supposed to be, a river or the sea or whatever the expanse of water is going to be. John, I'd like to try something here. We'll take a look at an action scene from Superman 3, and perhaps you can tell us what went into it. Hmm. Okay, I'd be glad to. All right, let's take a look at the scene. He's here. Good. Let's give him something to worry about. Now, let's see. Tracking systems locked. Let's begin. 
games begin. Woo! Don't tense up now, honey. You're wasting your rockets. Come on, Superman. Uh, let him have it, Russ. Bubba, keep firing. Keep them occupied while I get the MX ready. That had a little bit of everything in it. John, I'll let you walk us through all those special effects. Superman flying down the canyon when he is searching for the villain's lair um, are probably some of the, of, of the better flying shots which um, have ever appeared in a Superman film because we were particularly pleased with the way they turned out. And the, um, the rockets which appear from the floor of the canyon, um, these in fact were built in miniature because um, we, we couldn't shop around and buy any real life-size rockets. So um, we bought them uh, uh, um, t t to a smaller scale. And um, after we photographed them, we did actually find they didn't appear to be going quite fast enough because um, most of the members of the public have seen this type of rocket being fired in various newsreels. And so we decided we had to optically speed them up, which is a very simple process, just by leaving out frames and printing the other frames. And, and it gives them the appearance of firing much quickly, much more quickly than they were. And the, um, the Atari-type game was, in fact, manufactured for us by Atari. Um, it was strictly to our specification. We gave them storyboards um, explaining exactly what we wanted done. And I must say, I thought they did a most magnificent job for us. They did shoot them in many different small sections, and we had to piece together the um, rocket scores and the total score which um, the villains are uh, um, racking up and, and then we had to insert them within our television screen which is of course on the giant computer um, which um, was a part of the very large set which was constructed in the 007 stage at Pinewood Studios. And in fact it was the, the largest set which um, uh, was used in Superman 3. Now, John, I know that you have to protect trade secrets, but I have to ask this. How does Superman fly? He, um, he flies um, um, because uh, several different methods are used, actually. I mean, it isn't a simple thing. It isn't simply one um, particular um, special effects process which one uses to make him fly. There were many, actually. I mean, the, the most obvious one which one uses, one uses what is known as the traveling map process, which has been around for quite a large number of years, which involves the um, Superman in this case, or it could um, involve a car or a train or a plane or, or, or some other moving object, which we photograph against a, a, a blue screen, which is lit in, in a certain way. And then Afterwards, we, we go away and shoot what has to go behind him. Obviously, in the case of Superman flying invariably, it means taking a, 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 a helicopter over the skyscrapers of New York or down the Grand Canyon or, or a camera in the nose of a Learjet or something and, and shooting what the background is going to be at various speeds, actually. I mean, it is, that is simplifying it, actually. It, it, it is really much more complicated because invariably he has to fly very fast. And when you get up in a plane or a helicopter and you look down, the land appears to be moving at an absolutely snail's pace. So they have to have special cameras which will um, 
photograph at, at, as slow as two frames per second in order to, to give us the right sort of speed. So, so, so we do have units that do go out to all the various places where Superman is flying and um, they have to shoot these plates which we then marry up usually by the travelling map process you know, when uh, later on during the picture. And, and there simply are other um, methods of, of a similar nature which one uses but they they all have to be carefully coordinated together so that when you, know, you cut from a very large head of Superman he's flying and then you go to a great wide shot and he's zooming down the Grand Canyon as he does in Superman 3 that they all get coordinated together you know so it all looks like he's flying in one great motion and I thought they did it with mirrors well let's take a look at another scene Let's go see if Ricky's all right. You okay? Yeah. How did Clark Kent know that kid was in danger? First of all, he, he hears by his super hearing a, the high-pitched whining of the dog, which um, is licking little Ricky's face, which normal humans do not hear, but Superman does, which is why Lana Lang doesn't react to it. So, so, and then Superman, with his supervision, looks through the corn and spots little Ricky, who is lying unconscious because he's tripped over and hit his head on the stone. In fact, we did concoct that shot on two pieces of film by um, simply zooming in to Ricky lying in the corn and then photographing um, some other corn separately and marrying the two pieces of film together. Then as we zoom in to little Ricky, we dissolve the foreground corn away and it looks as if the camera is in fact pushing through the corn which um, you will have seen in the sequence. And then we have Super, um, Clark Kent, that is, changing into Superman, and, and he runs behind the paling fence, and the fence appears to be strobing, and he gradually, or quite quickly, but he gradually changes from Clark Kent into Superman. And then, with great brio, takes off to effect a rescue, which he does just in the nick of time, as you'll see. The, um, the various detail work of the threshing machine was um, photographed by our um, second unit action team, which had a task of following the main shooting unit around and picking up odd um, action shots, um, like the insert pieces of the thresher, um, because they don't require any major actors. And it is usually more economical and less time consuming to have an action unit to shoot these, these particular shots. Um, and in fact, in the editing process, um, it, it, it's quite a, a fast-moving sequence, but on the other hand, it does contain danger for the little boy, so um, it probably isn't um, the fastest-moving of sequences, because one wants to retain what is coming and an element of danger, so, um, you know, the cuts were probably of the nature of, um, of, of eight frames or so in length, which I think is probably sufficient to convey to the audience that um, the amount of danger which the boy is in. And, and one felt that um, in terms of editing, that was about the right sort of pace which one needed for this particular sequence. Mm -hmm.
John, I also felt that the sound effects were an important part of that mounting sense of danger. Well, when is the sound editor brought in on a film like this? Um, in practical terms, the sound editor is usually brought onto a film roughly halfway through the shooting process because by that particular stage um, there is a sufficient amount of cut together film so that he can start formulating ideas about the sound which will be necessary for the picture and um, obviously if one's working on a, a large-scale action film or a large-scale special effects film obviously there are many noises which are required and particularly in terms of shall we say the Superman pictures um, there are often things which happen in space or on the moon or somewhere where people aren't quite certain what the noise is supposed to be therefore they have to be totally created yeah and certainly in terms of of, of where uh, um, particular electronic apparatus which um, shall we say is not uh, familiar to everybody because it's been created for the film obviously we have to have noises to go with that sort of um, uh, of um, uh, hardware that, which is in use and therefore it becomes a very creative task for a sound person actually and um, I, I certainly know that they do go to the far corners of the world to seek out noises which they think are appropriate or people haven't heard before i mean to go with all the sorts of funny gadgets which people put into films these days and and uh, the process goes on what um we tend to do actually is we tend to do what we call um rough mixing as the film is edited the sound editor okay, we have to cut this. okay. rough mixing is that where well what we do we we, we sort of do